And so what exactly is the role of a principal engineer in an organization? Uh, right now I'm working for ADP in USA. Uh, I came to United States. So disclose how many followers you have on LinkedIn. And they have to select only 65,000 out of that. Like you can share, like what, what's the success mantra on getting a good profile or a good kind of a success on LinkedIn. So hello everyone, uh, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today uh, we have Bridge who is currently working as a principal engineer in ADP services. So let's hear from Bridge, a quick introduction. So hi Bridge. Hi Ankit, I'm good. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good too. Okay, so I'm yeah. very much excited to be part of this conversation today. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Bridge Pandey and uh, I'm working in IT industry for last 14 years. Uh, I started my career as a Java developer and then I worked in Java for a couple of years and then uh basically i've been working with python and uh, also on uh, on an array of technologies and tools i would say so throughout my career i have seen a lot of technologies and tools which came to market and and which also got vanished uh, but there are certain technologies which are still there in market so uh right now i'm working for adp in usa uh, i came to united states uh, i think uh, in 2015 yeah and since uh, then i have been working here uh, i work for three companies uh, in US. This is my third company. And um, I'm working here with a team which is uh, responsible for creating cutting edge uh, microservice based applications. Uh, and uh, I'm working as a principal software engineer, of course, like uh, you're going forward in this series, like uh, I'm going to tell the role of principal software engineer. Yeah, but right now, uh, that's all about me. So that's great. So like uh, Bridge has like moved from India to US. He has worked from multiple technologies. And Bridge, would you like to uh, disclose how many followers you have on LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. So right now, I think it's about 128k uh, followers. Uh, are that's, there on the LinkedIn. Yeah. that's a huge number and that's all because that he has been uh, he has been sharing a lot of valuable content on the tech side like especially i've been following his content so on the python side on the data engineering on aws on gcp on different kind of cloud platforms he has been sharing really good content like especially if you are like planning to excel in one of these domains he has shared some good tutorials that you can go through some kind of certification certifications that you can go through to make a good successful career in these domains so do check out his content it's one of the best especially i like uh, i think my favorite one is the backend burger that he has recently shared. uh i mean uh, the last video that i created on backend development how to become a backend engineer is actually inspired by that backend burger itself so yeah so that's mostly about it like how like i mean his linkedin journey like uh, it's it's really good and i want everyone to just go and check out his content it's one of the best that that you can find so bridge uh, like as you mentioned so what exactly is the role of a principal engineer in an organization so as a principal engineer uh, one is not focused only on the coding or, or or architectural work but apart from that one is also responsible for uh, working with other stakeholders working with cross teams across the organization uh, getting to know about their their tech stack and uh, also working with architects closely uh, to 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 design uh, and uh, develop applications or tech stacks. Okay, so this is uh, the role of a principal software engineer on a very high level. Uh, but I would just like to mention one thing. So there is a difference between a principal software engineer. Okay, and a tech lead basically or project manager okay so uh, i have seen like many people they get confused uh, that a principal software engineer uh, works or acts like a project manager or or technical project manager or program manager or or tech lead or something like that it's not like that okay so principal a principal software engineer role is purely technical in nature it's 100% technical where you also have to code a lot. So you are not away from the coding part, although you are involved in different kind of stuff like uh, dealing with uh, different stakeholders and also working with cross teams, okay? Uh, but you are not away from the coding. As a principal software engineer, I do a lot of coding. 80% of the time uh, I do coding. So. I think, uh, yeah, that's all about principal software engineer uh, role. 
and since you work with a lot of data engineers so like what exactly do data engineers like do i mean this is like right now data engineering is a very like a looked upon kind of a field it's very much in demand uh-huh. and kind of a, i would say that there is like a euphoria about like moving into that domain right so because you are already working with a lot of data engineers so what exactly is their role in in your organization if you can share yeah definitely i would love to share that uh, so basically um before that i would like to tell you that i have also worked as a, as a data engineer for a few years and uh, mm-hmm. in my current role also sometime i do act as a data engineer okay so the role of a data engineer is to uh, create uh, an infrastructure to process large amount of data so that is over, that is on a very high level i'm just uh, like oversimplifying this but this is the main role of, of a data engineer so let's say that you are a you are working as a software engineer in software engineering side let's say that uh, you are working in in back end engineering side mainly okay so in back end engineering side we have to follow certain architectural pattern in order to design applications right we need to take care of a lot of things like we need to decide the databases and we need to decide or we need to we need to finalize the tech stack and all those things deployment everything so basically what i would say is uh, data engineering is nothing different than this but uh, it's a like uh, like the goal over there is to process the data and uh, in back end engineering the goal is to create the back end part of an application okay so that is the main difference so in data engineering also we are creating the back end architecture but they are the goal is to process the data we are not concerned about any front end things or anything like that okay whereas in back end engineering side we are we are mainly focused on creating a back end okay for a front end thing so basically that is the major difference so as a back end engineer uh, it's very easy to move towards towards data engineering because there are many skills which which overlap basically between back end engineering and data engineering so i think that's uh, that's not very tough to move from uh, back end engineering side to data engineering side i hope that answers your question okay but but uh, from uh, what you we have been telling so you kind of work you are kind of working on kind of applications which are bridging uh, basically creating bridges between data engineering and back end right so what are the kind of challenges that you face while creating these kind of applications yeah so there are several kind of challenges i would say Uh, mm-hmm. the first and foremost is like taking care of uh, uh the pipelines basically so when it comes to data engineering i would say the main part is pipeline in the beginning so we need to have a robust pipeline to process huge amount of data again i'm saying this because uh, there is no point of having a data engineering uh if a data size is not huge so let's say that i just process uh, process like few gigabytes of data in a day so for that we don't need a robust data engineering right now because there are so many tools in market which can which we can leverage directly and we can do our task so when i'm saying about data engineering i mean we have to process huge volume of data okay so when it comes to uh comes to the challenges so uh, you, uh the main challenges which i have faced in my career is like uh, creating robust pipeline uh where we have to process huge amount of data with with taking care of all the security measures so if you work in enterprise basically so they are like we have to take care of a lot of things so that is the main part and apart from that like um, there are many other challenges i would say uh because for data engineering we need a different kind of consciousness so uh in economics they say that uh, if you are just running an an economy of a country there is no certain sets of set of sets of formula like if you do this then this will happen you may try this so for example if we have to reduce the inflation you may raise the interest rate right but it's not guaranteed that it's going to work in the in the right uh, right direction because we can't be 100% sure still there are uncertainties so similarly in data engineering side also there are many things which are not sure that if you do this this is going to happen it's not like that you can't guarantee that because still that area is evolving okay so there are a lot of challenges uh, but yeah mainly this i would say uh, uh, this security um, and the volume these these are two factors uh, which are going to challenge you always right and say for example if someone aspires to become a data engineer 
so what are the right kind of resources or the right set of path that he should follow to become a, like a successful person in that domain okay so before that like uh, there are there are two things so mm-hmm. one so the first one is uh, if someone is directly aiming to become a data engineer okay, without having any prior experience in IT industry or let's say that somebody is having some experience in front end side and he or she wants to become a data engineer mm-hmm. so for them i would say that uh, uh, it's going to be a bit difficult i would say it's not impossible but it, uh, but a bit difficult to uh, to get a break in data engineering industry okay uh, but the thing is that i would suggest them to just focus on four or five major areas and if they they are able to focus uh, in those areas then they will become interview ready so once you are interview ready then you can uh, still learn a lot of things while giving the interview and once you are able to crack an interview and get into some company then of course uh, your journey continues because that is going to be your starting point but i would say that there are four or five main areas which we should focus on so the first one is sql sql is very important okay second one is go with a, a programming languages so like you can go with either java or scala but i would suggest go with python because if you know python it becomes very easy to work with uh, work with a lot of things okay and the second thing is that learning curve is not that steep so you can learn python quickly okay compared to other languages okay uh, so i would say go with python uh, then learn uh, learn spark so in spark also i would suggest i would strongly suggest to go with pyspark because again again that learning curve is not that steep okay so and if, so once so once we know all these things then we should go for things like uh, like how uh, like how map reduce works okay so map reduce is a technique which mainly we have been using in hadoop kind of ecosystem where uh, we distribute our work okay uh, work among different set of clusters so you, you need to know that concept so once uh, once you are aware of all these things then you should learn about git like how you can work with git how you can create uh, like data pipelines okay i i included git because git is an integral part of this one because if somebody is going for an interview definitely uh, they would expect them to know about uh, about a version control system so for that i think git uh, is going to be the best tool one can learn okay so git then the fifth one is i think uh, one should focus on creating uh etl pipelines and for that the best tool i would suggest is airflow airflow is a library that was open source by engineers from airbnb so but that tool is very famous and most of uh, uh the industry uh, i would say that is the industry standard right now because most of the companies are using uh using the airflow so if you focus on these five areas then definitely it becomes very easy to crack a data engineering interview of course like there are other things which you need to focus like you need to build your resume you need to do a lot of a lot of practice using projects uh, in real projects so like there are so many projects which i have posted on linkedin a few days back so and also there are so many other portals from where you can download those projects so you just try to work on those projects and create your portfolio on github okay so mm-hmm. once you create your portfolio on the github then it will be easier for you to showcase uh, your experience for uh, and in that way like you will also be gaining a, a lot of knowledge and you will and you are going to have a lot of exposure to different things so uh, that's my suggestion for somebody who is coming from uh, the front end side or who is brand new okay in in software industry but if somebody is already working uh, in back end engineering side i would say then things be become become very easy over there because you know why because they are already aware of sql they are already aware of a programming language most of the time i see like people are working in either java side or python side so uh, or or if even if they are not working in uh, in python or java like they can easily grasp these languages like i would say python okay so they can easily grasp that python concepts and then apart from this uh, like uh, yeah so they can also they can also follow the same path but why i said this two uh, roads is because for a back end engineer 
the learning path uh, is going to be uh, going to be not that steep. So compared to a person who is a brand new in the IT industry or who mm -hmm. is coming from a front end side. OK, so, yeah, that's my suggestion for all the aspiring data engineers. Right. right. Like uh, now, like given that you have like traveled across the continent. So what do you think? Like, is, is this the right time to move to US if one is like aspiring to? And what are the kind of the best opportunities like that one can leverage to move from like India to US or from anywhere to US? Like how? Yeah, how definitely. Mean that thing? Yes. So I would say that US market is always lucrative um, compared to India because I have also worked in India. For many years i think about seven years so of course like us market is always evergreen especially when it comes to it industry never go on the news like they say that there are so many layoffs and all those things they they happens in it industry and that is a normal part okay so we shouldn't uh, focus on those negative aspects but when it, when it comes to the us market it's an evergreen market and there are endless opportunities i would say so there is no wrong or right time to move to US. It's always good if you are finding an opportunity. Of course, there are so many other factors uh, which you need to take care of and so many other personal constraints. But from a, prof uh, from, a professional, uh, from a professional point of view, I would say that if you want to grow your career and if you have some interest in moving to a foreign country, of course, US is the best one because there are so many IT jobs and, and the salary mm -hmm is also incomparable with other countries. Okay, you can't compare the salary, it's huge. Even you compare to any any European country or any other country would say, you are not going to get this much salary anywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would say that, uh, yes, they are, like there is no right or wrong timing. Time, you can move any time to this and you will never regret if you are capable. So I would say that uh, if you are capable enough to work in IT industry, then of course, yeah. I'm sorry. I think you asked another question. I missed that one. So the first part. Right. right. The second part was like, how can one make that move? Like what are the different opportunities one can look for? Like um, it's, it's not a cakewalk, like not every organization is supporting that move. So are there any external opportunities or something one can look for to, if one is yes. wanting to make that move? Yeah, definitely. So let me cover this. So, uh, there are, uh, I would say there are three kinds of visas which we can leverage to move to United States, especially for IT professionals. Most of the time in media or folks, they talk about H1B, that is very famous. Uh, but the thing is that uh, there is a complex process involved in that one. So you have to go through a lottery system and there are, I think three or four times, uh, like, uh, like US is getting uh, more than 300K applicants okay for h1b visa and they have to select only 65000 out of that one so competition is really tough okay that is a matter of luck so there is nothing about your expertise or anything like that it's all about your luck okay right. so so that is one path okay okay first let me cover about the visa type and then i would suggest uh, like how we can move to united states okay so we talked about h1b now another one is called called L1, L1A and L1B visa. So that is intra-company transfer visa, okay? One can also leverage that that route. And I would say there is no quota for that one. So oh. if you happen to come to United States and if your company is willing to sponsor, you can come right away. There is oh. no quota for that one. Okay. So, and the third one is O1 visa. So O1 visa is for like uh, extraordinary skills. It can be in IT industry also, but it can be in any other industry. So, for example, if somebody is in media or if somebody is in the fashion or acting, they can also they can also utilize that visa. OK, so now since we are IT professionals, so I will focus uh, focus on this visa from an IT professional point of view. OK, so let's say that you have been working in IT industry for four or five years. OK. If you want to come through O1 visa, you should build your profile. Your profile means they look for extraordinary things in you. So for example, you can do uh, some paper presentation in colleges, okay? You can have your article, article published in journals. You can write a lot of articles. You can do technical blogging, okay? Yeah. So all these things, because you can cite those things to USCIS in US and based on that, like uh, uh, they can take a decision. So like many people are not aware of this route, but this is 
like I think this is another route. Uh, what I would suggest is like if you want to have another session, I can go about this one in more detail. Okay, yeah. but uh, for now, these are three categories of visa under which one can come. Okay, now let us talk about like how one we can come like uh, like how one can come to United States on these three visa. So I'm I'm not going to talk about O1 visa, and of course I'm I'm going to talk about uh, H1 and and L1. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so let's just start with H1. So like nowadays, many companies are sponsoring this H1B visa. Like uh, they sponsored. So, for example, I came through Cognizant. So, Cognizant is a consulting company. So, I like all the big names, Cognizant, Forces. So, that all depends on your project luck. So, if you are not into that kind of situation, and if you want to come in to United States, there there are two ways to do that. One is like you can either go with some consultancies. Like there are so many consultancies who advertise about H1B visa. Okay, okay. but I want to give this warning. There are so many fake consultancies and they may file your H1 visa. You can, uh, like your name can can come to lottery, but when you are trying to travel to United States, it, there may be a, um, there may be some problem. So likewise, we have heard so many news. So I would not suggest that you should go to that route. Another mm -hmm. one is uh, join some boutique firms. Like there are so many small companies who, who have their own products, especially in data side. There are so many companies. You can do a Google search. Join with them. And normally they sponsor H1B visa. Okay. But again, like that is first step. The second step is you have to come through lottery. So oh. that is something which yeah we cannot uh, make sure that uh, mm -hmm. your name is going to select it in lottery. Okay. The, another one is now come to, let's come to L1 visa. Okay, so uh, if you are working for a company, like uh, you can... Let's say that if you if you want to join a new company, you can always negotiate uh, that hey, would you be able to send me to United States on on L one B visa? Okay. Right. Uh, so if they say that yes, we can, then if you if you are coming to if you are coming on L one visa, like uh, it becomes very easier to file for green card under EB one category under which you can get your green card in just a matter of two or three years. So oh. that is a big advantage. So nowadays I have seen in last several years, so many folks from India, they are also selecting that route, okay? Yeah. But the thing is that uh, we do not get this news in the media. All their yeah. focus is on H1B, H1B most of the time. But yeah. this one is, uh, this one is uh, I think a kind, of, a kind of hidden thing, which is yeah. not that much exposed to media or outside yeah. world. So yeah, consider this point that you can always come on L1B visa. Right. And uh, I mean, sorry, that is not L1B. It is called L1A or L1B, okay? There are two categories uh, uh, okay. in that one. So I'm not going into much detail about that one. Yeah. So yeah, so I think overall, like there are there are plenty of ways to come to United States. If you are really willing to do, you need to do a lot of work. You need to put some effort, but it's not very difficult, I would say. Like one one advice that you would want to give to data engineers, like how to basically excel in that career. Like we have we have discussed a good roadmap about uh, getting a successful career in that domain. But like mm -hmm. that one one advice that comes into your mind when you think of like when you meet any data engineer, this is something that I would definitely tell to him or her. Uh, yeah. So one advice I would like to give is to always keep on practicing. Uh, data engineering uh, uh, is something it's an area where we like un, you, you are not going to learn a lot of concepts unless you are doing the work unless you are doing the real work so now when it comes to the real work like uh, that that is not in our hand but what is in our hand is like uh, we can work on plenty of plenty of open source projects okay so once you work on the projects you are going to get real time knowledge and that mm -hmm. is going to help you a lot so just keep on working keep on doing a lot of hands on and, and of course, I think you are going to excel in your field. Nobody can stop you. So, yeah. So that was all from the technical side. Like, there's like one non-technical question that I wanted mm -hmm. to ask him. So a lot of people, like a lot of people, I like, want to grow in one social media or there are like a lot of people, like non-technical people want to grow on Instagram, but the Instagram for technical folks is actually LinkedIn, right? And you have really right. like grown very well on LinkedIn. So one advice or something that like you can share, like what what's the success mantra on getting a good profile or a good, of a success on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I would love to cover that part also. So, you know what, like, uh, until uh, November 2022, like, 
I had only 8,000 followers on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Okay. For it in, in those 8,000 followers, I think 6,000 were connections. Mutual. So basically, frankly speaking, there, there were only 2000 extra folks who were just, who were just Hello. following me. Okay. So I was just thinking that it would be really great if we can, if I can share my knowledge to new generation or great set of audiences who are just looking for knowledge over the LinkedIn. So I thought that, okay, let me try that. So I also heard that you should build your brand name on the LinkedIn. I was not aware of uh, like what a brand name mean mm -hmm. over LinkedIn. So when I started becoming active on the LinkedIn, uh, I saw that so many folks, they are just sharing stuff from here to there. They are just getting some stuff from here and just sharing that one. So I thought that, okay, this is, I think this is going to help me. So I'm going to just copy this one, copy this concept. I'm just going to do this. So I started doing that one. Then I realized that by doing this, I'm not making any brand name. And uh, there was one question which I always ask, okay, even to me and uh, to anyone. So I will ask, like, why somebody should follow me? So that is the question one should always ask to themselves. Why one should follow them? Okay. Uh, so this is the question which I have discussed like so many times with my friends, with, with my wife also. So she was just asking, uh, like, how easy it is to uh, get like 10,000 followers on the LinkedIn? Uh, I think it's very easy. I said, but why 10,000 people are going to follow you? Like what you are going to give to them? Okay. There must be something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that in the beginning, I also shared a lot of materials from here to there. I am not a front end guy, by, but I also couldn't resist myself in that area because I just wanted to share something. So I was getting some guides and I was just sharing blindly. Okay. Then I, uh, I was just uh, doing some, some brainstorming session with myself. And I said that, wait, okay, wait a minute. I'm not a front end guy. So why I'm sharing this? I don't have any expertise in front end area. I do have some experience, but I'm not an expert. Okay. So people are not, are not going to believe me because I'm not going to share a lot of insights in that area. So mm -hmm. I mainly focus uh, in those area where I'm working or where actually I'm expert in. So for example, data engineering, I selected two or three area, data engineering, and then backend engineering, architectural part. So uh, likewise, I have selected like four or five areas and I started posting some good content. Of course, like I have taken so many content from here and there in the beginning. I used to come up with my own content, but I started posting them. Then I saw that uh, in the beginning, number of likes and all those engagements were very less. But I thought that, okay, let me keep, let me keep doing what I'm doing. So I did that for few few days, I would say, and then I started getting some response. Okay, so after that, what uh, I realized is that you need to connect with your audiences. Okay, you need to give a message to your audience. Okay, that you are with them, and if you post something, they should have a feeling that there must be something good in his post. If you are just posting anything blindly just to get the audiences or get the followers that is not going to help you out in the long run because you are not building a brand name. Brand name is not like just sharing some contents just to increase your followers. Okay. Brand name is like, like there are so many folks over LinkedIn who have a brand name and uh, like if they post anything, it goes viral. I would say minimum there are 1000 likes, 2000 likes or engagements. I would say why? Because they have made a brand name over there. Okay. So, right. So the thing is that just by sharing things from here and there, you are not going to make a brand name. So I just focused on those particular areas and uh, I, I started working on, on the high quality content. Okay. So like, uh, I just imagine that if I'm an audience, right? So if somebody posts this and if I'm working in this area, okay, am I going to like this or not? Something like this. So I used to do a lot of brainstorming session with myself in the beginning. So that approach was there that helped me a lot. The second one is, uh, when it comes to the promotional post, I would suggest that for just for the sake of one or 2000 rupees, never go with the promotional content. Mm -hmm. If you really want to build a brand name, right. because the moment you are going for a promotional post, actually, I don't know the financial situation of everyone. So everyone has their own liabilities and situation, but still, if you want to build a brand name just for the sake of one or 2000, don't go for promotional post because if you're going for a promotional post, it sends a message to your audiences 
that you take money to post something which is not good right. okay what i would suggest is first build your brand name and later on if you let your audience decide that if you post something uh, then that is useful for them or not if they believe that it is useful for them then you can start with promotional posts right and then that is going to help them also and also it's it's not going to look very odd okay because uh, you have already been posting a lot of things and now you are doing a couple of promotional posts so that's okay but what i'm suggesting is not to do promotional posts in the beginning okay that's uh, yeah that's my suggestion so if you just keep on doing these things of course this needs a lot of a lot of patience uh, you are going to excel in that field you are going to gain a lot of audiences another important point i would like to mention is like uh, you should always be consistent so consistency doesn't mean that you have to post on a daily basis or twice in a day i can be just posting one post in a week but i can be consistent right so mm -hmm. just be consistent <clears throat> if you are away from the linkedin for few days i would say that's fine but as soon as you are back just go into your rhythm okay so consistency matters a lot never give up just keep on posting even if you are not getting likes or anything one day definitely you are going to get get that momentum and you are going to get a lot of audiences you are going to grow i think a lot of that also depends upon the kind of algorithm so linkedin also like plays around with its algorithm like sometime you'll get a lot of traction on your post sometime they'll not like even promote your post like it's all about like getting more eyeballs so it, and it all comes down to like what kind of algorithm linkedin is following so sometime for example they'll be promoting video based posts sometime mm -hmm. they'll be promoting text based posts sometime they'll be promoting like carousels it all yeah. depends upon like what their algorithm is currently you are right yeah. yeah that is there uh yeah that part is also there because uh, again uh, this formula may not work always so like uh, but most of the time it works you know uh, and there is you know what one important aspect i forgot so uh, basically the thing is that uh, uh, yeah you should be mindful of what you are commenting on others posts also okay okay because you know what uh, like i realized this one a couple of months back so i just commented somebody's post that so this is very nice and this is going to be helpful i got a message from a couple of folks that dude uh <laughs> like whenever i open my linkedin i always see your engagements okay yeah i always see that you are commenting here and there and and that to nonsense things like helpful and all these things so don't spam that time i felt bad a little bad about them but later on i realized that i learned a lesson i learned these things that if i just do some comment here and there there are so many folks mm -hmm. in my audience which like actually they will get notification that nice but they are not going to get any anything out of that nice comment so they will think that oh my god what is doing okay let me not follow him or let yeah. me okay something like that so i learned that lesson so if you are just first i would say that never do a lot of comments okay in mm -hmm. a day just do few quality comments like which is closely aligned with your audience so for example if i am if i am posting something from a data engineering perspective okay if somebody has posted about back end engineering or data engineering data science data, data analytics if i just put some useful comments uh then that is going to help my audiences but if i just say nice or helpful definitely i'm going to lose a lot of audiences although they will be following me but they will not take me that much seriously mm. okay mm. so that's the another thing which i would like to mention so yeah <laughs> So it was like one of the best session that we have had so far. Like, thank you for sharing all the knowledge. I would say that you have been like very explicit about what you have learned. That's the best thing that I have discovered. Like, not a lot of folks that I have come across are kind of so open to like sharing all that they have learned so far. Like, you have been exceptional on that front. So thanks a lot for that. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will be taking away a lot of good, good key things from this session. And I'll definitely plan one more session with you, wherein we'll be discussing like the journey of you as like what are the different visa processes and all, and how like one can basically get a good career, get a good settlement in that country. So we'll definitely uh, plan out something uh, that that we can that a lot of folks can look forward to because a lot of folks in India definitely like plan to like or aspire to become a part of that country. So yeah, surely. Yeah, definitely. It was my pleasure speaking yeah. to you. Yeah. yeah.